Uh, welcome everybody uh, to the LGBTQ panel. Um, I have uh, some great panelists here today and we have some uh, great questions for them and uh, we're gonna have a few questions at the end. Um, I'm gonna have each of them just, just really briefly introduce a little bit about each other, or themselves, I guess. Um, and why don't we start with Gabe? Hi everybody, I'm Gabe Zickerman. Um, I'm the author of four books on the subject of gamification, which is uh, game, gamification and video games have been uh, the vast majority of my career for the last like 20 or so years. Been working on making things more addictive. And then about a year ago, uh, raised some money from Founders Fund and moved to Los Angeles to start a new company called Onward, which is developing a new method for conquering addiction. And our alpha product uh, just launched like four months ago. It's uh, really kicking butt, and uh, we'll be able to talk about those results in public sometime in the next six weeks, but on our way to changing behavior for the better. And thank you very much, Gabe. And Amanda? Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Knackman. I'm the publisher of College Magazine. I started out actually as a print magazine, so I brought one of these relics to show you all that it was, that it did exist. Uh, today we're online, we reach students nationwide. We are for students by students. We reach about 780,000 college student readers every month. And our goal is to help students be more successful in college, and we help them with that journey. Great. Hey, my name is Chad Billmeyer. I'm the CEO of Panjo.com. Panjo is a marketplace for auto, sport, and hobby enthusiasts. Uh, our thesis is really that at this point, you know, eBay is over 21 years old and 80% of what's sold there is new. And so the enthusiasts that gave eBay their start, um, who are really passionate about everything from cars to skiing to flashlights to all kinds of things, um, need a home to buy, sell, and trade effectively in a community atmosphere. And just a little bit about me, my name is uh, Serge uh, Gojkovic, and uh, I, I guess my gay claim to fame is I helped uh, launch the app Grindr uh, many, many years ago, so uh, you're welcome. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I also most recently was the uh, chief marketing officer for the U.S. for a, an app called Happen, uh, which has about 14 million users worldwide. And I've been doing gay marketing on and off pretty much for the last 15 years. So I, th I think uh, we've, all, we've all had some experience in the gay marketplace, and that's why we're here today. So we'll kick it off. But first, before we do, I did want to just sort of make a, uh, kind of a quick call out to all the people marching today. Um, I think it's uh, super important that people stay involved and really do lead our government. And I know Amanda and some other people maybe have something else they want to say about that, but we just wanted to uh, do a shout out to all the people out there marching today. Yeah, I agree. I want to give a huge shout out to all the women marching. Actually, quick note on the Happen. We've actually worked with Happen. Oh, right. So yeah, I'm promoting that. Uh, huge shout out to the women marching today. I think that this is a great uh, example of how we need to, in different communities, lift each other up and support each other. And this march is a perfect example of that. And on this panel, we're going to talk about the LGBT community and how we need to you know, leverage that community, uh, network within that community, and lift each other up and celebrate that success. So I'm really excited to be here. And, and I totally agree with that and would also add that uh, one of the most radical things that you can do with your time or energy, uh, if you know you are in possession of the ability and interest and motivation to make a new idea, bring a new idea to life from your mind or from a piece of paper, one of the most radical things that you can do is build an amazing thing that transforms the lives of many people and makes a lot of money and uh, hires a diverse group of people and engages your community, both the one that you belong to potentially and the one that you want to create in the process of change and you do that constructively and accretively like every single day of your life as a startup founder. But the thing that you're doing, the thing that all of you hopefully are, are trying to do is in and of itself a radical act of creation and that radical act of creation, no matter what your business is, can be put to good use to changing the world. And so as much as you hear a lot of people in Silicon Valley um, come from a kind of like libertarian sociopathic bent. Uh, and they really do. And if you're going to raise money, <laughs> holy shit. Um, but, um, you know, they, co they come from that bent and they're often like, you know, all you have to, the only thing that your, your whole job is just to like 
make great product and change the world with your great product, and I believe in that, but I believe that you can also do that in a way that is really positive and really creative and, and really good at its foundational core. And so that's a thing you should bring forward. Chad? Yeah, Gabe, I think this is an interesting comment because I was just having a conversation with a venture capitalist who will go unnamed who was saying, uh, look, we were looking at self-driving trucks. And I think if I, I'm probably close to having this right, right, the number one job title um, in central U.S. is truck driver. So if you're thinking of a, a funding a venture that makes self-driving trucks, you're talking about putting a lot of people out of work. And I think this latest election has venture capitalists thinking about the way they deploy capital and the impacts it has on people's lives. And I think there's been a, a rejiggling of uh, some of the theses, the investment theses, and the positions people take on investments. Great, thank you very much, guys. So just uh, it's actually a really good lead into our first question, and I'll start with Chad, actually. Um, how's being part of the LGBT community made an impact on your business and your vision for your, your companies? Yeah, I'm gonna have to pass on that to somebody else, because ultimately at Panjo, um, as a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for enthusiasts, we serve it, you know, we serve all communities of people everywhere. We, we do think about um, who our target market is, um, and so we think women are really well served by Etsy and Poshmark and Tradesy and a bunch of other ventures. There's an opportunity for us to serve men, but beyond that, like LGBT doesn't play too much into, into our world at Panjo. But, but you do do a lot with communities on Panjo, and maybe not specifically the LGBT community, but you do work with communities in general. Yeah, entirely, yeah. 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 Uh, Amanda, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah. For us, we are a content site. We are giving information to college students. We're also creating a space for college student journalists. So I think about, you know, the type of message we're putting out there. I want to make sure that that message is inclusive. I want to make sure that the content that we're writing reflects our audience, that they see themselves in that content. Um, and that comes from recruiting student journalists. We you know, we look for students of diverse backgrounds, students that are involved in different organizations on their campus. We're looking for students who are passionate about the college experience, and, and that's it. So, I mean, it's, it can be in whatever they are interested in. So we're just, we try to look for students that um, encapsulate that. Um, students from diverse backgrounds, students from historically black colleges, students that have a story to tell, um, and we, we celebrate that. You know, we celebrate the student that wants to talk about their coming out story or how they got kicked out of their dorm for being transgender. And we encourage them to share that story and have it on our site, share it with their network and be heard. And that's what our site is all about is, is being a space for them to reflect their experiences and ultimately help them, you know, Gabe, did you want to want to touch on that a little bit? I have a slightly different take on this. So I've launched uh, maybe technically five startups, of which one was a great success, uh, two are still in business, one of them uh, was a spectacular failure, and then my current one, which is Onward, which, uh, for which I hope I have the, uh, the greatest impact. And in every single one of those cases, especially the last three companies, the majority of my team, in a weird way, uh, for whatever reason, have been gay. And we haven't run a gay company. None of my companies have been like gay companies. We're not serving the gay market, like whatever. But the thing that I figured out, especially in, in this company right now, we've got like um, nine of us total, seven engineers. Of the seven engineers, five are gay, which is an insane number. Like that's just crazy. And what, what I've learned over time is this. If you're gonna do a startup, you need every possible unfair advantage that you can get whatever those unfair advantages may be. And the biggest unfair advantage that you have is your network, so the people that you know. And I want to encourage you as much as possible, even though um, you know, at a high level, like large corporations uh, think about diversity as a programming effort, so something that they do as a, either corporate social responsibility or some other objective, for you, your own form of diversity is actually not like some nice window dressing. It's literally how you're gonna kick other people's ass. It's literally how you're gonna get the better quality people to partner with, the better teammates, um, the best possible talent that you can find. And so you should recruit uh, your partners wherever you can find them. And, and I'll just, I wanted Including to- Including Grindr, which is, I've definitely recruited employees yeah. at Grindr. And I, I have, for sure. Recruit them at Pride. 
Yeah, like wherever, Even right literally, at events. literally wherever, however you can use your network for unfair advantage you shit. Yeah. I saw and you at Pride. Uh, we were, let's talk business. Yeah. We were actually talking, we were laughing, Gabe and I earlier, saying that it was, it was a surprise we hadn't met before because... We know a lot of the same people in just like five minutes. So I think it's really important to always, even though you think you know everybody, it's always good to go out there and try to meet more people. And uh, Chad, did you want to add I something? I think this is raising a point of how we get in the situation we're in where so few women are running Fortune 500 companies. Or if you have white male leaders who are hiring white male executives from their network, you end up with white male-led companies. Gabe, I challenge you to go more than 50% you know, straight in your, in your venture. Yeah. But I think right, it's important for yeah. all of us. I think to the perspective we may bring all of us in this room as uh, uh, as an underrepresented community is, you know, am I, I come from that experience, am I doing everything I can to have a diverse leadership team within my organization? Yeah, and, uh, and also, you know, in raising money, there are a lot of gay organizations out there that can help you. There's Gangels, there's Start Out. I, I, I would say, though, if, if you don't mind my saying, I actually, I think, I, I think it's the opposite for an early stage startup. I actually don't think that I don't think that diversity in an early stage startup is actually the goal. I think unfair advantage is the goal. And the best way for people who are not straight, white, wealthy men to make a positive change with their entrepreneurial venture as an entrepreneur is to hire aggressively and partner aggressively with the people in your network. Lift your people up. If there is a lesson from successful minorities in the United States, Okay, it is lift your people with you, right. take them with you. Your job is not to worry about diversity from your diverse, from your non-straight white male background. You don't have to worry about bringing in straight white men into your mix for they're some there. time. They're there. They're there. Yeah, they're gonna like. This is the thing. Like, they're gonna come. Don't don't stress about that. Lift amazing, <laughs> wonderful, underrepresented, uh, underutilized people with you. Thank you. So moving on, we're going to go uh, change shift a little bit here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, most of us have tried to launch startups or, you know, out in the audience too, and it's really hard to do sometimes. So just sort of not really having to do so much with LGBTQ, but, you know, how did you, Amanda, how did you start, get started on your business while you were still like working full time? Like, how did you do that? Just to give us a little advice on that. Yeah, so I actually started College Magazine from my dorm as a senior in college, uh, but I had already had a job lined up out of college working in a consulting firm. And I remember even pitching my idea on the on-campus entrepreneurship center, which if any of you are in school, leverage that community, because that's a whole nother community that you have a lot of people that are eager and excited to help out for free, okay? So, and even after college, you know, take advantage of that, get scrappy, um, get people that are willing to volunteer uh, their help uh, because they're excited about your idea. So the, the way I got started was I, uh, I made a print, like a little print mock-up of my magazine. I did a photo shoot with a girl on my campus. I uh, printed out a small little mock-up from Kinko's and went around my campus and said, we're College Magazine, and would you like to advertise? Would you like to reach college students? And a lot of them said no, <laughs> until finally we had one advertisers say, you know, I'm really sick of the school newspaper giving us a tough time about how we're letting in underage kids to our bar. I mean, we know the campus bars, how that works. So they're like, we're gonna, we're gonna put our budget with you. And, uh, and that's how I got my first advertiser. And they're like, you know, who do we write the check out to? That's great. And, and I was just like, uh, College Magazine LLC. I went to the bank the next day, and I was like, I need to open up a bank account. College Magazine LLC. I mean, that's how you have to get into it when you're first starting out. You have to just, just step right into it, get scrappy, sell it as if it's bigger than what it is. You know, we didn't exist. I printed it off at Kinko's, okay? It didn't look like this at first. Uh, and get someone to believe in your idea, to give you some money, you know, don't sell your idea for free, and, um, and go and- how, how many of you are doing B2B startups? Focusing on business? Okay. So um, Amanda's story is super, super important because in the B2B world, you always begin by selling something you don't have. B2B businesses 
the hustle in B2B is always, here's a thing I could make and I might have ready tomorrow, do you want it? Because in B2B businesses, you can't get anywhere until you've got customers who sign up. The hustle in a B2C startup is a little bit different because it's hard to get uh, consumers to buy something that they can't touch or feel. So it's a little bit different order, but hustle is so important. Chad? Yeah, I think, well, David talked about that too. Even in direct to consumer, you can still do that. So his anecdote, I'll, I'll give a more specific one. Uh, there was a food, comp food service business that did not exist. They built the, built, had photos on a Shopify site in a matter of hours, so it looked like the business existed, ran ads to it, got sales, so charged people's credit cards, refunded them, I'm super sorry, we're not available in Tulsa, Oklahoma yet, we're coming to your town soon, right? And then went to VCs and said, we generated $100,000 in sales yesterday, there's demand for this business, I need to raise money to go build this business. Yeah, and, I, and just to add to that, I think you know one of the biggest reasons Grindr was so successful is because the founder himself you know, he, he wanted to meet other gay guys when he traveled or when he was in a different city. And, and it solved a real problem of how do, you meet, how do you meet other gay people around you? And it was a very simple, basic problem, but it, 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 it was creating a lot of, you know, friction in the sense that we, it was difficult to meet people when you travel to different cities uh, or even around the block. And so uh, Grindr really solved the problem, and I think whenever you launch something as a founder, if it really solves a problem that you're having, most likely you're gonna be very successful because it's something that you live with every day and you know that it's been causing you problems and you're trying to make it better for everybody. We did that at curb stand with valet parking, right? Like how many, nobody has, I was a CEO there, nobody has, uh, nobody has cash to ever pay for valet parking, right? And it's a simple problem, but it was a problem that was easily solved with technology. Can I ask how many of you are a founder that is working full time right now for someone else, not yourself? Oh, founder, yeah, you're working for someone else and you're like, okay, how do I get out? How do I do this on my own? Start working after work on your business every day. I did that, I camped out at coffee shops. I worked on it every single day. It was my second office. And I did that for nine months till I caught the attention of an investor and in a handshake, you know, said, hey, I'm looking for funding, and said exactly what I was looking for. So that's how, I, that's how I transitioned from, you know, running my business as a hobby business to making it a full-time effort. Great. Um, and I guess um, just sort of, we're going to take some questions from the audience, but just uh, some sort of closing, uh, closing advice to LGBTQ entrepreneurs. Um, and why don't we start with you, Gabe? Um, oh. Uh, rather than giving advice to LGBTQ entrepreneurs, I just want to kind of give advice to everybody who's like been, uh, you know, doesn't feel like they come from a place of privilege on the function of starting your own startup. So I've been totally out professionally since I started working. Uh, I finished school kind of early, so I was about 20 uh, when I finished grad school and started working professionally. And um, and I, I just didn't know any other way of being other than being like, I'm a gay man. And like any opportunity I had to, you know, when I was up on stage or whatever, I, was, I would always identify as gay and be like, you know. And, and I, there was like a lot of bullshit in the early days from people that I didn't really understand was bullshit. It was just like, you know, like people just not taking me seriously or dismissing me, you know, whatever that would happen over time. And, um, and uh, in... A couple years after I got into the video game business and I was relatively high profile for a startup that I did there and um, I was at some conference and this like kid came up to me one day and he was like, you don't know me, um, but you're the reason why I'm a video game programmer and why I got my dream job at Valve and I was like, what? And he was like, you know, and I wasn't that much older than him at this moment, right? Like I was like six or seven years older and he was like, I saw you so many years ago at this like conference, I was just a student, I was volunteering and I saw you and you were up on stage at, at Game Developers Conference and you were like, I'm an openly gay man and I'm like doing this startup and I'm like doing all this stuff and he was like, oh my God, I can totally be an openly gay person and work in video games, which I didn't think was possible. And so I went and I did it and I was like, oh my God. And I was like, you know, tears, right, tears. But the point was, uh, the point that I'm making is, 
even if you never have that moment where some young person comes to you and says, like, you inspired me because you are a woman, because you are of color, because you are disabled, because you are gay, because you are whatever, and you did this startup, I promise you that your acts, your little brave acts of being yourself and doing your startup are helping people just by doing them. And just being out there and doing the thing that you're doing is inspiring and motivational. And so I cannot encourage you enough that if this is a thing that burns inside of you to do, no matter how much bullshit you get, you have to keep doing it. It's important. Agreed. Oh, uh, thanks, you guys. But it is. It really is. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you very much, Gabe. Uh, Amanda, did you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, if I could give advice to anyone out there again, that is part of the LGBT community or is a woman or a person of color that feels like they may not be getting the same advantages. You know, you can't help but ask yourself, you know, if I, if I was the majority, would I have had more opportunities? You know, I, even I ask myself, could my business have been growing a lot faster if I was male? Um, you know, would I have had more financing? I, I don't know. I can't know that. Uh, but what I do know is that every day I set a vision, I have, a, I have goals, I look at them every day and I say, how am I working towards those? And I think that a lot of times, new founders or someone that has a great idea, they feel that they have to have everything perfect and aligned before they can launch or before that idea can materialize or before they can quit their job. And they're like, when I do this, when I do this, does anyone have that, like, that massive to-do list? Then I can breathe, right? You know, when we reach a million monthly unique visitors, then, then I'll celebrate. There will always be something more. So I would say start small. Do something small. You know, gather someone that's an enthusiast for what you're doing to join your team. Make that small impact to start showing that there is something coming around your idea that you can start making your idea tangible. And it, that is how you turn your idea into a business. It's by starting small, getting scrappy, okay? Spreading that enthusiasm. And that's how you're gonna build something that is great and that is how you're going to scale something. Well, and your good example of making the photocopy flyers and going around. You started with something small and made it into something huge, which is great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.